Okay, this is Old Electronics Fan, and this video is the result of a viewer asking a question. And I must confess, there are times when I don't include things in my video because I don't realize how interested others might be in those particular details. This viewer said, could you explain to us um, about the cartridge that you installed in this? give details on it and so on. So that's what I'm doing. Now this, I'll zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see it. And I see if I can hold it steady for you. Um, I use these folks because I heard about them through radio, TV, phone or not. Um, I know there's others out there. Um, I've talked to, I think it's Gary, um, when I was trying to figure out what cartridge to put in this. In fact, I still have, I didn't think I did, but I still have the original cartridge that came in this. Um, CN75. Uh, this cartridge is indeed dead. This is a Varco. I'd forgotten what that was. Now, there was um, a bracket that held this in place, and this cartridge, which is, let me back out a little bit, this cartridge, which is the Fan Steel 228D, and he wrote on the side of it DS73, um, and it says underneath there Barco TN8U, so he decided that would replace this. Now, Here's, oh, I guess that's the old connector that came on this. The, the issue you're going to run into when you're dealing with vintage record players has to do with the RIAA standards. Um, it's kind of cockeyed, but the angle of the camera. All right, well, let me read it to you. Um, this is Wikipedia. So this is RIAA equalization is a specification for the recording and playback of phonograph records established by the Recording Industry Association of America. Uh, the purposes uh, of the equalization are to permit greater recording times by decreasing the mean width of each groove to improve sound quality and to reduce the groove damage that could other arise during playback. Um, the RIAA equalization curve was intended to operate as a de facto global industry standard for records since 1954, but when the change actually took place is difficult to determine. Before then, especially from 1940, each record company applied its own equalization. Over 100 combinations of turnover and roll-off frequencies were in use. The obvious consequence was that different reproduction results were obtained if the recording and playback fil filtering were not matched. Um, the, RI I, the RIAA equalization curve, oh, come on. I don't know why you're doing that, um, is a form of pre emphasis on recording and de emphasis on playback. A recording is made with the low frequencies reduced and the high frequencies boosted, and on playback the opposite occurs. The net result is a flat frequency response, but with attenuation of high frequency noise such as hiss and clicks that arise from the recording medium. Reducing the low frequencies also limits the excursions the cutter needs to make when cutting a groove. The groove, is thus, groove width is thus reduced allowing more grooves to fit in a given surface area, permitting longer recording times. This also reduces physical stresses on the stylus, which might otherwise cause distortion or groove damage um, during playback. A potential drawback of the system is that rumble from the playback. Turntable's drive mechanism is amplified by the low frequency boost that occurs on playback. Um, players must therefore be designed to limit rumble, more so if RIAA equalization did not occur. RIA at playback equalization is not a simple, simple low-pass filter. It defines transition points in three places, which corresponds to 2122 uh, hertz, 500 hertz, and 50 hertz rounded values. 
and so on. And you can read this. This is a, like I said, this is, um, well, let's go. This is on Wikipedia, RIAA equalization. You can read all that for yourself. Um, I just thought it was interesting because, and the, my primary reason for doing all of that is that you will find issues with, um, well, here's what I ran into. I know I had this level, but I'm not sure why it's not level. It needs to be adjusted more. All right, so. Hmm. Not sure why that's cattywampus. This is a homemade base, so apparently I didn't get the legs the same height. I thought I did. I have to work on that. The. Okay. What I ran into. In fact, let me. Well, no, before I do that, let's look at the cartridge. I ran into issues trying to use this the way I was wanting to use this. I wanted a, turn, a, a record changer because I want to stack records up and let it play, which is how I use this most of the time. I have other single play turntables, one of which is sitting here. Um, so, so I got the cartridge, I wired it up the way they said, and I tried to play it through, um, well I have a 1984 realistic stereo, which is mentioned elsewhere in another video. Um, and that did not work well. The way this cartridge is designed is that the high frequencies are very sharp and crisp and very definitely strong. I had to basically turn the treble on that stereo all the way down to get this to sound halfway decent. And I forget what the other changes were. I have up here a Harman Kardon 30, 330B. That was one of my projects to um, give myself more flexibility when it came to dealing with stereo equipment. Prior to this, I used this mono uh, PA amplifier, realistic PA amplifier, little 35 watt deal. And you probably see this little thing right here is something that I just recently uh, set up. Everything from here over, now from here over, that has to do with this. These are speakers that I have above and these, this one's going to change, but I have two sets of speakers up on my shelf, and this is the stereo part of this. I have stereo output, and you'll notice, you probably might be wondering if you can see, what, uh, see what's here. These are couplers that are designed to go from mono to stereo. Um, I rarely use these. Um, I was thinking of making a short connector to go between the stereo out of my Harman Kardon and the speakers here and here. Um, I set this up this way so that I could also say I have a, a pair of stereo speakers and I want to test them out. I could plug them both in to here and listen to them and get a sense of whether they're working well to, and uh, working the same and so on and so forth. Uh, and I could also use this for that kind of a test if I wanted to. Um, Actually, no, that would not work out. Never mind. I would have to alternate connecting the speakers one at a time into the into the output because this I have a test out here. It's a mono output from this, and I can feed this into a speaker, and I can use that for a variety of reasons. I've used it for a lot of things, including feeding my signal generator into this and then feeding it into a speaker that I'm trying to adjust. So. I was getting frustrated with all kinds of loose wires being everywhere and trying to find the right wires when I wanted to hook something up, and I just completely got aggravated. I also set up here, 4 ohm, 8 ohms, if the speakers are way off 8 ohms or way off, or way off maybe way low, I'll, I'll use 4 ohms if they're, they're higher, 8 ohms are higher, then I'll use that. It gives me a sense of how, it's be, how they're behaving. Because speakers behave differently depending on their uh, resistance and the amp that they're being run off of and, and so on. But anyway, so I'm wanting far afield. So, um, but for the kinds of things that I'm going to be doing today and in the future, I hope, I wanted to have something that was a whole lot easier to use and less frustrating. And I wouldn't have to hunt for, okay, which wire was this and which speaker did this go to and all this other stuff. So... 
back to our regularly scheduled program. So what I want to do, okay, first of all I'm going to show you on this cartridge, you can't see it, but there's a Phillips screw here. And now, the bracket that came with this, this is a royal pain in the neck. There's a little clip. Maybe I can, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit here. Oh, it doesn't look like you're still able to see that very well. Let's see. All right. There's a little clip right here. And that is a royal pain to get out. But I want to show it to you because getting it back in, you got to make very sure you got it in the right spot. So you've got to clip this, pry this up, and carefully get that to pop loose. There's a little slot in the top of this, and there's a little flat... Um, extended portion of this clip that has to drop into that slot. So, there is, this is a two-part clip, as you can't see. Let me swing this around. All right. Why are you humming at me? Boy. All right. So this new, this is the new clip, and I believe there's a, been a while since I've done this, but I think there's a second part to this clip that allows you to use the screw Oops. Use the screw on the top of this, which you can't see. Um, I don't know if you can see if I do that. Um, no way. Um, yeah, there's a screw right there. So you, you, I believe it's been a while since I've done this. I believe that screw holds the, the uh, part. I don't want to take that apart because I've got this set up the way I, I want it to go. I don't remember. I do not remember if I had to jury rig anything or not. Um, it looks like there's a little. Let's swing this up now. I very much doubt you can see. Um, zooming in does this get drives me nuts. Well, you can't really see it. There's a little plastic bracket that hides behind here that goes that mounts to this, and these two screws screw into that, so. Alright, now I, I went through all the trouble to take this out, um, because I want to show you when you go to put it back in, to make sure you've got it fully snapped in. The uh, wires, they, it's nice, they give you the, the information on how to wire it, uh, what goes where, and uh, you have to be really, really careful of these pins. They are not, uh, not extremely sturdy. They're delicate, so be nice to those when you're trying to slide those on. These are the new clips that they provided with the cartridge, so I soldered those on the end of the wires. And now, notice there's a little tab back here and there's a little slot back here, slot back here that this goes into. And then, Get that in there, and now, and what I have, what I've, what I've always done is I help this by pulling back on it, and press this in, and when it's in where you want it to be, this will be in all the way, and there'll be no, it won't move at all. Um, if you put your fingers across the top of this, basically. This and these ears should be very close to the same height. Um, come on, come on, focus. I don't know if it will help to zoom in or zoom out. Um, and that's going to be blurry, isn't it? Uh, oh, there we go. That's what I want. All right. Okay. So you've got two little ears here, and there's your tab. So make sure. When you put your finger on it, this little tab should not be sticking out because if it is, this is not latched in properly and you'll probably be able to wiggle it a little bit, which obviously you don't want. So, um, out of there. And, oh, the other thing, let me, let me see if I can focus on what I want to do or what I want to focus on. 
course not. Let's slide you again. Yeah. All right. Now, come on, cooperate. This, this is how you change the tension on this. There's a little metal plate here, and you actually slide, you actually slide the spring, slide the plate through the side of the spring um, to get the tension here that you want. Now, this is very different than the turntables that have a um, that have a counterweight on here. These are very sensitive to how high you're lifting the tone arm. So let's pretend that this is your that this is your um, uh, scale. I've, this is about the same height as a scale. If you put this up on here and you go to measure it, it's going to be a little bit different because your tone arm is up higher. Because what you really want to do is you want to get you want to measure your tone arm pressure when it's riding on the record. Now, since this is, is a turntable, um, you're going to have records stacked on here, so you going, are going to have some changes in the amount of pressure the record on the top of the stack gets compared to the one on the bottom. Again, one of the downside, downsides of the spring style tension. What I did to try to make sure that I had the um, correct tension was I took the platter out because I, I verified how high this was compared to this and then I made sure that my scale was the same height as the top of this so that when I rested my tone arm on it I really wish I could lay my hands on that but I don't seem to I don't know where it went. It should not have gone very far. Never left the room, but anyway. So I put this down inside, put my tone arm on it, and, and got the correct tension. So my goal was to get the tension as close as I could under a base condition where the tone arm was resting directly on a record sitting on here. And then, uh, because if you measure it with it up here, it's going to read lighter, or, I'm sorry, it's going to read heavier than it's supposed to be. So if you're measuring on top of this, your gauge is going to give you a higher pressure reading than if it were down inside on the same level as this. And what could happen is that you go ahead and adjust it with this on your turntable, on your platter, and depending on where you get it in the range of acceptable, I think this is three to four grams, something like that. So let's say you set it at three grams with it up here. When it comes down to the record, it might be closer to two grams, and you might actually get it to skip. So to avoid that, I always try to make sure that my base measurement is done at the same level as the, the platter is. So that's that's one thing to be aware of. Now let's get back to the other part of this, and um, I want to let me zip this out a little bit. Yeah, okay. So what I want to do is I have a record over here. Actually, I'm gonna plug this in, get this all set up and ready to go because I don't think it is. I hold this over here and then didn't set it up. Didn't plug it in or nothing. Okay, all right. Okay. Oh, before I do that, let me just go over one other thing. There's a video, and I'll put a link to it above here. Um, I think a humming and buzzing, oh my. I wish I'd come up with a different name of that for that video because um, some people were confused and asked me, did you ever actually get this working? And they didn't realize that that other video was about the final resolution of this. Um, the problem was that video had in it the amplifier and my attempts to deal with the humming issues that I got from this. 
and the turntable where I had to resolve the issues of noise coming from this. But after I got all done, I was still getting noise and I finally, a very helpful reviewer um, mentioned that this BSR turntable, uh, and I can't remember what model number it is right offhand, but there's another video. The only, the only BSR table uh, videos in here are having to do with this turntable, I believe. Um, but this is a BSR, I don't think, do I have, uh, no, wait a minute, yes I do, um, this is a BSR UA5, or 15SSA, uh, UA15SSA, now, they were kind enough to mention to me that these motors that are used in the, in this particular turntable, are what they call a two-pole motor. This is a shaded pole motor. It's got two poles and it tends to be noisy. To deal with the noise caused by this, I finally came up with this. This is a Schaffner, um, let me get you the part number. Maybe you can zoom in and you can read it. Let's see, can we get in there enough? Oh, let me throw some light on it. And then you can, let's see. Oh, get out of the way. Um, let's see. Oops. All right. Well, I read FN207. Looks like a 0M3-06. Um, this is uh, an... EMI RF filter and this little guy right here is what made this turntable much more usable. Um, my tendency uh, when I'm playing records with this is to typically play this at a relatively low volume. I'm usually laying around reading and I just want this as background music. And so the problem that I had was there was some buzzing and noise coming from this. I finally pinned it down to that. Um, like I said, go to the humming and buzzing on my video and you can see what I did to finally resolve that. This was the cure. I mean, I've been using this quite a bit recently and it's just much, much better. Um, Far better than what I had before I put this on here. So, but what I want to do now though is I want to show you. Now I have not tried this with my Harman Kardon amplifier, so I have no idea how it's going to behave. But first, but first what I'm going to do. Uh, let's go. I guess I got to do something with some wire management there. I didn't do what I should have. Um, let's see. There you go. All right. Got to get my wires wound up, round up, round it up. I'm ready to go. Now, do I? Do I? Do I? I don't need that because this has one. Yes, it does. All right. So, here's what we're going to do. Over here, I have a more modern turntable. And I got some Gordon Light, but of course, as you, as you well know, I can't play that for very long, or the content match guys will nail me. I found some other records that I discovered they wouldn't content match on, but they were classical music, kind of boring, and very, very beat up and very noisy. So we are going to, I think that's ready to go. I turn the volume now. All right. So I have this ready, I think. Up, oh, yes. All right. Let's see. Okay. So that gives you an idea. 
you know, I can't play this for very long. I don't want to have to go back in and edit the thing and have it not um, it's a pain in the neck when you have to do that. deal with the content matching when they got you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this out of here and I have the cord that goes from this turntable and I'm going to plug it into let's go that volume plug that into my jack here and and I don't need to wait for that to warm up because well no forgot to unmatch that stop it all right so um, let's see I think you can already tell it doesn't sound very good. In fact, this one sounds distorted. Uh, and it's very, very, very bright. Now, I think, I'm pretty sure um, that my realistic stereo will behave better than that. But, so what I'm going to do now is, I'm going to take this, plug this into this amplifier. Hopefully I get that plugged in right. And then I need to hook up these speakers. So I'll take you out of there. And I'm gonna have to cheat a little bit, I guess. Um what did I do with that? Okay. In there, in there. Alright. Yeah, I know they are shielded wiring. That is shielded wiring. So now what I'm going to do... Oh, I'm going to shut itself off. I went too far. Oh, maybe not. So, because this is a tube amp, we've got to wait a minute for it to warm up. Come on. Okay. Hopefully. Alright, let's see what we got. speakers that I just fed this through are different than the speakers I was using where this was. So I had to change the tone a little bit. So you can see that there's a significant difference between how this turntable works with this little Magnavox amp over here and how it works with that. Now I'm surprised, well, that 330B is I don't know, that might be 1970s vintage. I'm not sure. You probably still have the... I kept manuals. I may even still have the manual for that somewhere. But, as you heard, this little cartridge is pretty stout. It puts out a fair amount of voltage. And it works very well when you have the right amplifier uh, to go with it. Now, I tried this with my realistic stereo. I have, um, it was a Morse and I couldn't get, I, I couldn't get any information on the little unit itself. It was a stereo radio phono uh, amplifier that apparently came out of a console. And I thought it came out of the same console as this one, but I don't think this is the same age as the Morse. It is a few years older, I think, than that Morse. The Morse did not like this turntable either, and that was a tube-type amp. 
the the thing I'm getting at is you've got to be careful about what kind of amp you're going to be using this cartridge with. Um, and I, I I will readily admit I am not an expert when it comes to this. Um, I knew about the RIAA EQing system, but I did not really know much about it other than that that, that, that was the equalization that was used for record playback. The um, the stuff I just read you from Wikipedia, some of it I just did not know. And like I said, if you want to research that yourself, go for it. One of the th one of the problems that you're going to run into is that if, like me, you have a turntable that came, well, let me back up. This turntable, this amp, the Morse amp, and some other stuff were part of a package of basically what the, the lady whose husband had passed away thought was junk. I wanted that collection of stuff for this, and I'm, you know, I've got what I wanted out of this. Has been working great for me. It does what I want it to do. I didn't know. I didn't even know. I had no idea this was in the collection. I didn't even know that the little Morse was in there. I was basically going after this. So once I got, I went through the collection and found these two guys. This sat on the shelf. And I basically ignored it until I ran into problems with this not working well with any other amplifier that I owned. So I'm thinking that this amp went with this turntable. I'm guessing that that's the case. But regardless, the EQ on this is different than the Morse, it's different than the Harman Kardon, it's different than the Realistic. Now, if I were to, well actually let me back up, I already know that this turntable will play through my Realistic just fine, you heard it play through the Harman Kardon just fine, so it seems like in the late 70s and the 80s um, there actually was some consistency in the way that records were recorded and in the way that the amplifiers designed the phono part of the amplifier is designed to play those those records on um, was designed relatively consistent um, so that you could take a turntable like this and put it on a Harden Carden or a, a, a Pioneer or, or, or a Realistic or whatever and you'd actually, it would actually work and um, so I, I I say all that because I got a little, I was a little bit frustrated until I found this little amp and got it working by the fact that this cartridge, which was clearly working fine, um, wasn't playing nice with all my other amplifiers. So basically this and this are well are wedded together. They, If I want to use this, I have to use this. There's just no way around it. And um, again, I don't know, I don't know if this was definitely part of a console, this little amplifier, there wasn't a lot of information on that. I, I actually contributed to the radiomuseum.org the schematic for this because I couldn't find one anywhere. And so I went through this and recreated a schematic for it, and I provided what little information I had. In fact, I think off hand. I think this might be a 1958. Somewhere around there. That was my best guess. The other thing that was interesting about this little amplifier is that it says tuner power. So this is definitely designed for use in consoles. I mean, it's clearer that it was. And some consoles like the one this came out of didn't have radios and some did. So some models of this little amp had a, a jack right here that would allow it to do either turntables or or um, tuners and um, so I got I was fortunate and I I, I kind of wonder well it's a mystery to me I don't know where the Morse came from or why it was in that collection of junk maybe he had a new another newer turntable that he used for something else and that the Morse was just left behind um, but the Morse was actually, other than a cruddy uh, tube socket, the Morse was working. Although I did find out later that the uh, balance control was shot. 
which I still haven't gotten a replacement for it, and I don't know if I ever will because it's not it's not high quality. Let's say it's a Japanese stereo amp, you know, stereo radio and phono amp, and it didn't excite me. Let's put it that way. It certainly couldn't compare to this. So, um, so if you're thinking about replacing a cartridge in one of these, like I said, um, this is one source. This is not the only source. You can check out. Uh, you can do your own research online. The website for this is thevoiceofmusic.com, which I think I, I zoomed in on this earlier, and you probably could have got it from that. Um, and there is a phone number on here. Um, if you want to contact them, which you can probably get from their website. Um, but like I said, the let, let me back up. I don't know how many different cartridges were used in this turntable. I don't. I don't know if they were all the Varco style uh, cartridge that I have in here. The CN75 that is in here. If your particular turntable doesn't have that same cartridge, and I would strongly encourage you to talk to them. But I would also discuss with them if you don't have the original amp that came with your turntable um, I would discuss with them what the, the appropriate turn uh, cartridge might be depending on the type of amplifier you have. They might be able to give you that information. I didn't even know to ask that question. I didn't even think about it never even never even imagined that there would be an issue I just thought put a new cartridge in it and you're done and I know that well and that was what my experience was in the past because well I was used to dealing with stuff like this where your cartridge goes bad you get a new one you plug it in wire it up adjust it and you're done so this was kind of a surprise <laughs> so um, like I said, VM, uh, the VM audio enthusiast is a good starting point for you, and they they definitely, he knows what he's doing, the guy I talked to really seemed to be knowledgeable, and if I'd known to ask the right questions, um, he probably could have explained some things to me, and if you want to learn more about this stuff, I'm sure he has a, a ton of knowledge, so, anyway, I, this, I didn't want this to be a really long video. But there were a couple of things I did want to share with you, and that I did want to um, give you some helpful information uh, that might assist you in your in your attempt to replace cartridges in your vintage turntables. And just know that this and that and you know there's actually there's older turntables than this. You have to be careful about what you put in there for a replacement cartridge unless you're planning on using a more modern amp. And then again, you talk to Gary or whoever who could help hopefully refine the type of cartridge that you're going to want to use um, in your setup. Okay, well, I was thinking about something. I thought, well, is there anything because that amplifier was distorting. Okay. I was thinking, was there anything that you could do to make this turntable work with an amplifier like that that was really not happy with it? Now, this little box is something I made to um, digitize my record collection. Basically, it's a, just a volume control and some wiring in there. And so you put an input, an output, and it allows you to control the amount of signal that you're sending to, in my case, the uh, microphone input of my laptop. But it would also work on this. And I wanted to show you what this... I'm putting the tone control on the, on the amplifier where it was... Um, when I was playing this turntable, playing this record on this turntable. And I'm surprised because, well, the other thing that I ran into, and I'm not sure why, I'm not even going to try to figure that out, there seems to be some hum in this when I use this. And this is all metal, and everything seems, as far as I know, to be grounded. 
Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe I didn't use shielded wire inside. I don't know. I've never run into this in all, all my other applications for this, but in any case. But what I discovered was that this one, this Harman Kardon, um, actually you can get it to sound halfway decent with my realistic stereo. Um, the um, I had to turn the treble control almost completely off when I was trying to feed this through it and it, it still didn't sound the way I would like it to sound. And going through this little amplifier it's way better than going through that, that stereo. So let's see. So right now I've got that set up with the tone controls about the same about the same as what I had on this. Let's see. I didn't make note of it, but Now you've heard me turn the treble down a little bit. And all I had to do was turn this down a little bit to reduce the volume. And now it's uh, and so now it's sounding actually halfway decent. I'm surprised. I'm surprised that that works as well as it did compared to the other one. But so uh, if so if you run into a situation where, like in my case with the uh, Harmony Carden, the output of the cartridge is too much, you could insert into the signal line of your of your um, turntable some resistors, pair of resistors, and you could find out what kind, what resistance they should be by making something like this. And I think I, I believe I have a video on on this. Uh, it has to do with digitizing um, recordings from tape ca uh, cassettes and and uh, amplifiers uh, or yeah turntables that are fed through an amplifier. And you can use the uh, line out um, and something like this to drop the signal down to where the microphone input of the uh, the um, laptop, in my case, wouldn't get upset with what you're sending it. Uh, the other option would be to, if you have a, happen to have a small mixer, you could use something like that to feed the output of this into a stereo, because um, you could use the trim control on your on your mixer to knock this down. Plus, you'd also, depending on your mixer, you might even have some EQ that would allow you to EQ this to make it sound the way you want to. So I didn't think of that when I was doing the video originally, so I'm just sort of sticking this in here. Um, there was something, oh yes, I was talking about the vintage of, of these, uh, this amplifier compared to the Morse. I, like I said, I think this is like 1958. I think the Morse was probably early 60s, you know, 60 through 62 or 3 maybe. Um, so there's only a few years between the two, but the Morse is definitely not happy with this cartridge. But anyway, so I, I wanted to do that because uh, I was thinking, well, what if somebody does get a cartridge, a new, something with a new cartridge, and it doesn't work with their system? Is there anything else that you can do? Well, those are a couple of things that you can try. And like I said, for some reason, I don't know why this is humming. If I go up, you can hear it. So, unfortunately, I got interrupted. Um, by, it was an important phone call, but I got interrupted at the tail end there. So I just want to wrap up with this. Um, you could wind up if you change the, uh, the cartridge in this, and you stay, and your, and the, the audio device that you're trying to run this through is something similar to my realistic, you may wind up with something that doesn't sound as good as you want it to. 
just be, I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, in the case of the Harman Kardon, um, if I really wanted to use the Harman Kardon with this, I could get rid of the hum that I'm getting with this by simply mounting a couple of resistors inside on the turntable and feeding the output um, to the, the line out here to feed into that, that stereo and that would probably solve, solve the, the humming issue. And if you wanted to make something like this so you could figure out um, what resistance would work to reduce the signal. Um, it's some, you know, there's not a lot involved here, so if somebody want, if you wanted to do that, um, but yeah, you know, like I said, talk to somebody before you buy something. Uh, I definitely would encourage you to do that. And now that I've prepared you for what you could possibly run into, then you'll have the right questions to ask. I didn't know to ask the questions. I was fortunate that I was able to that I had this to use, or I would have been very disappointed in the outcome of this. Um, I've been using this a lot, and so I'm happy with what I wound up with. But um, if you don't have that option, then you may want to consider a different a different cartridge. So I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, I know this isn't a very long video, but then. I think I've answered the questions. I hope I've answered the questions. Um, if not, the comments section is always available and you can put questions there and comment on on this. So, like I said, I hope this has been helpful and I hope I've uh, explained enough. Um, I'm certainly giving you more information than I had when I got into this, into this project. So, anyway, I'm going to wrap up here. Thanks for watching. Thank you.